Alright, well, it's, it's really simple. We have here today one of the world's great storytellers. I mean, I think that pretty much, I think we all know that. Um, it's incredible that he's here at Slamdance to share uh, his experience. He's covered generations of, of this, you know, of huge, huge audiences. And uh, we also have this amazing documentary at, at Slamdance too. And so with that, I'd like to please introduce Will Hess. Come on up, Will. And also our very special guest, Stan Lee, everybody. Now, one of the things that Stan is uh, you know, known for is taking that uh, you know, go back to the 40s and the 50s. A lot of the illustrators and pencilers and inkers that, you know, nobody really knew who they were. Uh, you know, Stan would give them nicknames, give them, start giving them credits on the, on the front covers of uh, the comics. And they never signed their name. And nobody, most of the time, knew who wrote or drew a story. There was the story in the comic book and that was it. So I decided to give credit to the writer, the artist, and, and so forth. And then I thought, that's kind of dull. I thought if I give them little nicknames too, it would make the kids remember them and make it a fun thing. So I called Jack Kirby, Jack King Kirby, and um, Steve Ditko, Sturdy Stevie Ditko. He hated that. <laughs> I called John Romita, Jazzy John. He hated that too. Or John Ringading Romita. Anything that, that came to mind, and most of them hated it. But it stuck in the readers' minds, and the readers began to get to know these guys and care about them. And just like in the movies, they started having favorite artists and favorite writers and so forth, and they would discuss it. And I liked that very much. I called myself Smile and Stan, which was kind of itchy. But uh, <laughs> then they started calling me, because it sort of... There was a baseball player years ago named Stan Musial, and they called him Stan the Man which I always thought was great, very macho. And then after a while, they started calling me Stan the Man, and I loved it, so that kind of stuck. So that's why I'm as macho as I am. <laughs> we have many young and emerging storytellers here at Slam Dance this week. Yeah. What advice would you give those storytellers? I, I really don't know how to advise a person. You've just got to do it. The one, one rule I always followed so many people write things for other people. In other words, they write a story and they say, I'll bet <clears throat> men from the age of 17 to 30 would love this kind of story. They do that in movies and television all the time. They write for a certain audience. I don't know how to do that. I write stories that I think I would like to read. I hope there are enough people who have the same taste I do. I'm not that unique. I'm adorable, but I'm not that <laughs> <laughs> And I, I just write to please myself. And I think anybody who wants to write, if you write something that you yourself are interested in, and you can't wait to see what's going to happen next, what you're going to write next to, to resolve this thing, then you're off to a good start. Were you influenced at all by Greek mythology <coughs> or... Um, you know, Greco-Roman mythology, Celtic mythology, how, how did that influence you? Did you read Joseph Campbell or Fraser's The Golden Bough or anything like that when you were young? Oh yeah, I, I read the Greek mythology, the Norse mythology, and Roman, whatever I could find. I, I loved mythology. I loved fairy tales. I loved anything bigger than life and imaginative and, and dramatic, yeah. What were the movies that you liked? What were you watching? Oh. Yeah. Anything that Errol Flynn was in, I wouldn't miss. He was, he was my idol. I wanted to be Errol Flynn. And in fact, I would leave the theater when I was about 12 years old. I'd have a crooked little smile on my face. I thought the way he smiled. I had an imaginary sword at my side. And I was looking for some little girl that a bully was picking on so I could protect her. You know, I, I wanted to be Errol Flynn so badly. And of course, I like King Kong, and I like Dracula, and I like Frankenstein, and any of those big movies of those days, I love. I always enjoyed um, your characters. Um, 
I was just curious, what, who are some of your favorite villains that you ever wrote? I know you like a lot of them, but... I think my favorite villain probably was Dr. Doom. I love the fact that he was the king of his own country. And if he did something here in this country, if he committed a crime, you couldn't arrest him because he had diplomatic immunity. They, they don't play that up enough in the stories now. Uh, out of the projects you worked on over your life, uh, could you talk maybe about one that you found that was the most enjoyable? Oh, oh, they all were. I, I don't know what the most enjoyable. I, I really loved everything I wrote. Maybe, maybe I loved writing The Silver Surfer a little bit more because I was able to add a little more of my own, for what it's worth, philosophy into The Silver Surfer stories. But I, I loved writing them all, whether it was Doctor Strange or... Nick Fury and his howling commandos or Daredevil or whatever. I loved him. Did you like the Silver Surfer more because it connected to the youth during that time? To the youth? Yeah, like the, in the 60s and 70s. No, it connected more to me. <laughs> I, I, had, I had the Silver Surfer make what I thought were philosophical comments about man and where we're going and why we're the way we are and here we have this fantastic planet, which it should be heaven on earth. It has everything. It has water. It has fertile soil. It has beautiful continents and different kinds of people for interest. And yet, we can't get along well together. We're always fighting and having wars. Are we crazy? What is it? And I try to put all the things I think of into the Silver Surfer's dialogue. So that's why I enjoyed him very much. How did you work with the studios in getting this material into your independent documentary? Perseverance. <laughs> <laughs> and, really? and, and Persistence. Like, it's not yeah. an easy one to... No. And you've got clearances on all of this material and they all... Yeah, legal took about two years. and. Uh, you know, it's, uh, fair use came in handy for some of it, but yeah. uh, but we have you know contracts but for all necessary clearances yeah. have been cleared. Yeah. Every interview was done on a different day, so we couldn't <coughs> even yeah. like have everyone scheduled in one day. We had to like literally go one day at this person's house, and like it's like wherever we could fit a green screen in, <coughs> and like shoot there, and then move like in that another week to another location. So it was a lot, a lot of work on these guys' part in terms of getting people. Yeah. To he only has it. some challenging locations. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we would meet these people on their Frank Miller. We met on his movie set. Um, we would fly to them and would have to set up wherever we had to. And we used the digital green screen. Um, that's what it's called, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you had to have Every a certain shot. space yeah. in between uh, the subject and the background. And a lot of times that didn't work out. Sometimes, Sometimes. we're hanging out the window with the camera yeah. while we, uh, the <laughs> screen was in the... Yeah, that, no? yeah it, was, it was fun. It was a good time. Uh, and all that stuff that you see with Stan and Jonah at his house, that was all shot in a few hours in one day. Yeah. But, you know, like, what uh, after you start doing a lot of those actor interviews, you realize, uh, well, that's when we realized we needed to go and find the illustrators that were still alive that worked with Stan in the Silver Age, which is the 60s. And a lot of those guys are dead, but, um, you know, we went to New York several times and sat down with them and tried to get as many of them on camera just telling us whatever they could remember, you know.